I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm fine, thanks. So what time is it in Vietnam right now? It's something around 11 at night. It's pretty dark. It's pretty quiet finally during the day. It's pretty noisy. Well, it, it, and what's funny is from a guy that started off in Poland, lived in Chicago for a while, now living in Vietnam and has gone touring through North Korea and elsewhere. I mean, you've put in a full life already. And as interesting as all that is, I'm going to be focusing on just a small part of that, your, your trip through North Korea. Sure, sure. It's, um, you know, it's my 33rd country, North Korea, so I've, I've been around quite a bit. Yeah. I, he, here's here's where, I, where the conversation comes in. Right now, North Korea is kind of that popular that popular uh, focus for news. We, we demonize right. North Korea. And what I've been trying to do is find out more about North Korea, not so much as it exists through the news, but as it exists as a country, as, as a group of people, much like Canadians, is not defined by Stephen Harper, our prime minister. It's defined by the people that are, are the average Canadian. Were you sure. able to get any sort of a local experience while you were there? You know, local experience is difficult to define because the, the visit to North Korea, and that's because with any visit, whether you're a tourist or whether you're a diplomat, is so highly coordinated that it's it's really difficult to to tell what's actually what's actually real, what's actually truthful, and what's and what's staged in front of you. But um, but I like to believe that I did get to experience at least minimal local interaction. I mean, for example, in one of the hotels, um, I met this waitress who was, um, I mean, she spoke barely any English, um, you know, just enough to, to sell the beer or, or, you know, or some, or some rice wine to, to the tourists who come along. But, um, one of the, one of the fellow guys traveling with me, um, he had his little tablet with, um, with some video games and he showed it to the girl and she was just, she was absolutely mesmerized. I mean, it was like a moment when I, when I first um, got my Nintendo at like three or four years old, and, and the girl was just, she couldn't believe that she can touch the screen and that it moves, and she was playing Angry Birds for a few hours. It was it was a really touching moment, you know, like you don't think about those things living in the West where it's everyday life, but... Um, well, you, you bring up an excellent point, and, and I thought this was my favorite point in the whole documentary, coming towards the end as you were building your conclusions of your trip is that our immediate reaction is to somewhat pity North Koreans and saying that they're poor, they're, they, you know, they're, they, it looks like most of them are suffering. But at the same time, they don't really know that they don't have computers or tablets because they have no idea of what's outside of their own world. You know, that's true to an extent. I mean, many people, many people, I heard, I heard this argument from that North Koreans don't really know any other reality, so they're happy with what they have. I still don't think that they necessarily have a very happy or very easy life. I mean, I'm sure it makes it much, much easier that they don't know what's outside of North Korea, because if they did know, then then I doubt that the system would still work. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's I, I got the feeling quite a few times that it was... Um, that it was this country where, where the lying has just gotten extremely out of control, where things may be completely backwards, and everybody might realize that it's completely backwards, but but they don't even point out that, that it's completely backwards because, well, I don't know why, actually. I mean, whether they're, whether they're afraid or whether they've been taught that it's that way. But, for example, I mean, on, on the street in Pyongyang, um, one of the days I was just walking down the road, and there was this grocery store with... Um, which was basically completely empty except for a bunch of plastic fruit on display and um and any question as to why was the fruit plastic why you know why even have a display of plastic fruit in the store in a store that's not selling anything and you know the questions were just the questions were just brushed brushed off you know nobody had an answer nobody wanted to talk to and talk to me about it nobody wanted to explain it and Ignore those things. You just move on. You just accept it. That's the way it is. And um, you know, that's a scary reality. Yeah. With uh, Matt Dorjancic, and he is director of, of a documentary that's a must-see. It's a wonderful documentary, DPRK, The Land of Whispers. It's available on YouTube, and uh, after you watch it on YouTube, please uh, please make a contribution, uh, uh, you know, a couple of bucks, just to say thanks, uh, and all the information's at the end of the movie. But again, DPRK, The Land of Whispers. It occurred to me as well as we, uh, as you were wrapping up the documentary, you, you spoke with, I believe, he was um, uh, an Australian diplomat that that was uh, uh, that that was uh, talking about Korea, and it occurred to me as well. He brought up an interesting point, saying, "Well, 
it's not that they're offensive, it's that they're defensive, that North Korea is actually feeling very threatened about South Korea and the U.S. Do you, do you buy into that argument that maybe we're the ones that are scaring the bejeebers out of the North Koreans with all of our talk about coming over and doing war games right outside of their door? I mean, I, I think it's a two-sided conflict, but I think that um, especially in this current um, escalation in the recent month or months, um, I very much see the U.S. And, and when I say the U.S., I mean U.S. and all the Western allies as the aggressors because, you know, you cannot say that you're coming, bringing peace and bringing, bringing help for the people while you're, while you're blowing up, um, you know, bombs and doing military exercises basically inches away from this country. You know, they get, they get every embargo, every sanction possible on this country, which, um, which many of those sanctions, you know, they're, they're, they're very valid, and I understand why they're in place, and they're they have a good reason. But the thing is that eight decades eight decades later, none of those sanctions have actually none of those sanctions have actually made the government of North Korea weaker. What they have done is they they caused a lot of suffering for the North Korean people who already deal with a lot of hardships. So um, seeing that for for such a long time that didn't work, I don't. I mean, that's like repeating the same mistake again. Going to you know, going to scare them, to to push them, to press them even more, instead of actually sitting down and and trying to maybe you know maybe reason with them, and um, you know they might be they might be a bad government. Um, I mean, not might be. They, uh, of course, um, you know the North Korean regime is has a lot of atrocities on their hands, but the thing is that um, I don't think that I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. If the choices are nuclear war versus dialogue, then it's a no-brainer. It's a no-question what you have to go with. And right now I see it as two kids fighting over a toy. The, the conflict is over egos. America doesn't want to step, step down because they don't, want to, they don't want to seem like the weaker one, and North Korea does the same thing. And um, you know, until one of them is the smarter one, until one of them um, you know, takes a step back and, and tries a different, smarter, more educated approach, I don't think this conflict is going to get solved in any in any reasonable way. With Matt Dorjanzik, uh, director of uh, a, a wonderful documentary, DPRK, The Land of Whispers, available on YouTube. And uh, please get out and uh, uh, very, very easy to watch. It's it's wonderfully done. Uh, DPRK, The Land of Whispers, again, uh, it's on YouTube. My last question for you. Uh, you. You mentioned how controlled a tour through DPRK is. And you mentioned that, you know, at no point, you know, they're telling you who you can take pictures of, when you can take pictures, the angle that right. you can take pictures of. At any point... Did they explain to you what would happen if you went, quote, rogue and just said, you know, I'm going to leave the tour group for a little while? Did they explain to you what the punishment would be at all? Um, no, it was never really clearly explained. I mean, I heard, uh, I heard a story from the, from the Western tour guide about uh, a tourist who once wandered out to the market and somehow nobody noticed him. And some guy just wandered out to the market, bought some peanuts and showed up. Fifteen minutes later, he was apparently somehow completely oblivious to where he was and why he was there and what he was doing wrong. But luckily, no one actually spotted him. In my case, I mean, there was there was security on me at all times. I mean, there wasn't even a question of of you know of wandering away and what would happen because that was simply that was simply impossible. You know, from the start of the trip, they just kept repeating, you know, that's our law. You have to follow it. Um, deal with it. So. Wow. You know, the thing is, it's difficult to talk with Korean people because, um, you know, they think in such different terms. And it's one thing to say that they're trying to be controlling and that they don't they don't want to allow you to do things. Um, but it's another thing where, you know, they I think that this propaganda is so ingrained in a lot of their minds that um, in this country in general, they're not taught to to think. They're not taught to reason, but they're just taught to repeat things until they genuinely believe them. So me asking them why can i not do something to me it might seem like a logical question but i genuinely don't think that they've ever questioned that themselves i think that they've been just forced to basically accept it forced to go with it and and i mean that's what they do because they genuinely have no choice really is such an interesting story uh and again the uh, the name of the documentary dprk the land of whispers matt thank you so much for the time today uh, and and go get some sleep would Very you much. you're burning the midnight oil right now <laughs> for sure, for sure.